you get lipid soluble, water soluble. What type of hormones are lipid soluble? Sex hormones. Where is the receptor located for a water soluble hormone? Which one is going to have an impact on the nucleus of the cell in the beginning? Lipid soluble. Lipid soluble. Okay. So then um, we did the hypothalamus and the pituitary gland. How does the hypothalamus communicate with the posterior pituitary gland? Nervous. Nerve, direct connection. Yeah, so it's an extension down from the brain. How does the hypothalamus communicate with the anterior pituitary? Hypophysiological system. Yep, so the hypothalamus will send in a hormone. What name is going to be associated with a hormone that we know comes from the hypothalamus? Releasing or inhibiting. So whatever hormone we name from the pituitary, you just plug in releasing or inhibiting, and we know that's coming from the hypothalamus. Drops into the blood supply, the hypophysial portal system, goes down to the anterior pituitary, and then it melts into the So then on the pituitary side, this here is the anterior pituitary. So we'll just kick off on the posterior. What are the two hormones from the posterior pituitary? Oxytocin. <laughs> and Oxytocin. And antidiuretic hormone. So what does oxytocin do? Milk ejection. Yeah. So it, and smooth muscle contraction. So smooth muscle in the terms of the uterus is contractions for labor. So maybe like baby ejection. And then mm -hmm. in the breast, it's bringing delivering the milk to the to the front, the lactic versus sinuses, right by the nipple, which is milk ejection. So it's constricting of the smooth muscle. Um, what about antidiuretic hormone? What does that do? Targets the kidney and tells it to retain water. So it's the whole water in. So really, you're getting more concentrated with electrolytes. And if you're not bringing in enough water, your body's like, you know what, maybe we shouldn't let so much out. Let's just kind of hang on to it a little bit more. So, and for all of us that sit and we're not drinking enough water, you know, we tend to run on antidiuretic hormone a lot. And so we will talk about, actually, you only get it in, you know, four, where we talk about actually drinking alcohol, people drinking any alcohol, or beer, or any kind of liquor, actually alcohol suppresses antidiuretic hormone in your pituitary gland so that you're no longer retaining, so you're actually letting more out. And so people think when they're out um, drinking with their friends that they're like just drinking more and so they have to pee more. But they actually are also not retaining as much their intraday so then they pee more than they would have expected, actually more than they would expect for what they're consuming. So, but we'll deal with that. we deal with that with we deal with fluids for the human flow, but that's where this hormone will come back into play again. So now the anterior pituitary ones, what does thyroid stimulating hormone do? Target the thyroid with the tropic hormone, and then the thyroid is going to dump out T3, T4. So we'll talk about that when we're done with the growth hormone story that we're going to do next. Adrenocorticotropic hormone, what is this one doing? Target the Targets the adrenal gland and just the cortex of the adrenal gland, exactly. So this is going to be related to stress, and we're going to talk about this one today as well. What these two are known as gonadotropins because they're targeting tropic, targeting the gonads, ovaries, or testes. So what is luteinizing hormone doing specifically? Um, doesn't it release estrogen and testosterone? Yeah, so it's the sex hormone one. So in males, they'll be releasing testosterone. In females, it'll seem like the release of estrogen. And follicle-stimulating hormone? Sperminate. Sperminate, yeah. So the follicle would be the gamete itself. And then prolactin. No production. No production. Yep, so prolactation. That's where it got its name. Um, growth hormone. Growth. <laughs> that, that one's super easy. So, okay. So, we've got that. Today, we're going to do histology. We're going to look at some histology slides. And so, you're going to see the pituitary gland is basically just the plain side and the busy side. That's all you're going to see. Super simple, and then on the test, you'll just see an image. You're gonna have to I'll say, Where is this coming from in the body? You'll name it pituitary, and then I'll be pointing to one of the sides and name it. And then I might say, Name some hormones from here, or name hormones from the other side, or whatnot. But so you're really gonna start, we're gonna put a visual element to it. So we'll look at some histology slides to make sense.
So as far as growth hormone goes, we just know it's easy. It's going to be similar as to grow. But it depends on do you have growth plates? Are you a kid? Are your epiphyseal plates available or are they not? That's going to make a big difference on what the signal is actually being asked, uh, asking of your body. So what giantism is, is a condition where you have a lot of growth hormone being secreted from the pituitary gland. And if you are prepubescent and you're a child and you have your epiphyseal plates available, that is stimulating the hyaline cartilage to be made and the bone cells are going to invade and the cartilage gets made and that's how long bones grow. And it happens on opposing ends. So it's hyaline cartilage, hyaline cartilage, bone cells are moving down, bone cells are up there. So bones are growing from either end. So excessive amounts of growth hormone in children with the epiphyseal plates still available, with the cartilage plates still there, allows for obviously a fast full rate and a rapid growth. So they will get very, very tall very quickly. The opposite being pituitary dwarfism. It's where in the same kids, epiphyseal plates are available, but they're not getting a the signal. There's just maybe just drip, drip, you know, not very much growth hormones coming out or none at all. And so even though the kid's there, their plates are available, they, you know, go ahead, they've got good nutrition, they might be able to grow, they're not getting the signal to grow. And so those are considered to be pituitary dwarfs. It's fairly rare um, in westernized countries or more with more modern medicine available and, um, and more pediatric evaluations of children to determine if someone's perhaps lacking in growth hormone production. So um, the two-chair dwarfism is actually a fairly rare occurrence in war. So I want to make a distinction. It's different than other types of dwarfism. Other types of dwarfism have to do with some chromosomal issues. And so generally other types of dwarfism are marked more by proportional um, differences in people. So for instance, some types of dwarfisms may have a normal or average torso dimension, but shorter limbs um, or different. So this one, pituitary dwarfism, they tend to be more um, proportional, just proportionally shrunk. They just do get the stimulus to grow. Um, so then acromegaly is excessive growth hormone production after your adult. So both Giantism, you can see this gentleman here. Giantism and acromegaly both are from too much growth hormone. It's just the difference is giantism occurred when the epiphyseal plates were intact and the growth was occurring. For acromegaly, it was an adult, so there was no place else to grow except for the soft tissues of the body. And so there are other, other complications besides that. So both of these are a hallmark of excessive growth hormone release, but again, one's an adult, one's a child. So here we can see it's a very old picture. This is normal height, let's just take scratch that because that is politically incorrect and apparently very rude to people. So we should make average height because anyone that's not that, you know, they're not normal. So average height person. So you have giantism. Obviously, this person had an excessive amount of growth hormone while they were young and pituitary dwarfism. You see this guy here was just perfectly proportional, just very, very small. Um, and in fact, a little fun fact about it is the original Wizard of Oz, all the munchkins, were pituitary dwarfs. And they would say it would be almost impossible to remake the movie in that manner because you wouldn't find that many pituitary dwarfs anymore. So one of the benefits of taking kids to your normal medical checkup because if they're not, you know, kids can be low in the growth chart, but if they start to fall off the growth chart, then they know that be concerned, perhaps get a supplemental growth hormone or have that address. So again, it's a, a easily treatable and easily detectable. Um, and so now it doesn't happen very often. This is also a really old picture, obviously. This is acromegaly. You can see this is what she looked like when she was younger, and you can see the profound facial changes, particularly in the nose, where the last soft tissue enlarges, and later on in her hands and her face as well. So this is, she can't grow any taller, but she has an excessive amount of growth hormone. As I mentioned before, a lot of times this occurs because of a tumor in the pituitary gland, and often the first symptom is not growing is really vision changes because remember the location of the pituitary gland to the optic chiasma, the crossover from the two optic nerves, it can often encode on that. So, so again, sometimes odd little uh, symptoms like that could mean, you know, 
know, a much larger problem. So let's just kind of do a recap from where we are. So we know the location action of the hypothalamus and pituitary gland. So the hypothalamus is in the diencephalon right there below the thalamus, and it's connected to the pituitary gland by the infundibulum. How the hypothalamus gets activated and inactivated is basically sensing everything from our body. And so whatever it senses, if there's too much of something or not enough, it's going to then communicate with the pituitary gland to make it fix something or do something in the body. So in itself, the hypothalamus isn't going to be sending a hormone that goes to the body. It sends hormones or signals to the pituitary and is then coming from the pituitary that would then circulate throughout the body. Um, so we've just kind of recapped already the hormones of the pituitary gland with the anterior and the posterior, and don't worry about the anterior I don't know why. Okay, so then we're going to move on to the thyroid gland and parathyroid. So most people are aware that the thyroid gland is in the neck. So it's going to be on the anterior surface, it's right in front of the trachea, right below the cricoid cartilage. So this is the thyroid cartilage, which is the Adam's apple, and then this is the cricoid cartilage right below that. And so we can see where the thyroid gland is placed right there. It's right below the Adam's apple. It's right between where the sternocleidomastoid muscles sit on there. So it's a little lower than I think people expect it to be. Um, it sits very low. You can, if you're going to palpate it, it's easier to access it actually if you have a person sitting down and you stand behind them and your hands come from around because you can kind of have a lighter touch rather than pushing on and out. You can still pop it, but it's a little bit easier, especially you're not looking and you kind of go more by feel and then you can evaluate better if it's enlarged or not. And now you kind of know where it's at. I see people, it's not all the time, but not unusual. If you're going through Walmart or something, you'll be in line, you look around, you're like, I don't know, 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 um, so you'll be noticing some enlargements on people around. It's not easily uncommon, but it's, it's noticeable in some people when they're fairly enlarged. So it's wrapping around that airway, the cricoid cartilage and the trachea. So we can see it here. In this case, it's lifted up a little higher with the neck in that position. Um, the isthmus, so it's like a bow tie. It's like a funky, weird, gross bow tie. So the narrow middle part is known as the isthmus, and then the two sides are known as lobes. You have a right lobe and a left lobe. You can see that here. Again, so the histology, this is what we're going to be looking at later today. Um, so this would be, we're looking at the thyroid gland under low power. So this would be at low power, you're seeing lots of circles everywhere. Then you kind of see a few more circles, and then when we finally get to a higher power, we're looking at the cells, we can actually see some cuboidal cells to actually make it up. The whole circle itself is known as a follicle. So each one of these little circle patches is a follicle. And really, they're like a soccer ball, but this got sliced. So you're really seeing like a soccer ball filled with this paraffin gel, which we're going to later find out is some T3, T4 components. And so you're getting a slice of that, and you're just seeing the cell making the rim of it. So that so follicle is more of a circular spherical structure. So the features that you're going to need to identify when we get to the histology portion is just know that each circle is a follicle. It's a storage area where it's sort of dumping this T3, pre, T4 precursor. And then we've got follicular cells. Follicular cells are the simple cuboidal epithelial cells that actually make up the follicle. So a, a way to remember it, or kind of a funny little, a funky little way, is if you're thinking of this, viewing this like it's a map, think of it as maybe the follicular cells are actually like lakefront property. So if it has a surface that's actually touching this open lake, if you will, then it will be a follicular cell. Um, they are going to be the ones that's going to make our T3 and our T4. Then we have parafollicular cells. So they're going to be the not lakefront property. They're out here in between the follicles. They're way over here, and they're going to make calcitonin. So calcitonin, we're going to learn T3, T4 is a metabolism. Calcitonin has to do with calcium regulation. So we'll talk about that. We'll go on to um, some more histology here. So here's two different views. One's a little more zoomed in. So we have the follicular cells, or uh, the follicles. We can still see the follicular cells. We can just see the follicular cells more easily in this 
increased magnified view on the right. So the hormones, we have these two coming from follicular cells. And so this is, and we'll move this here aside to you, is T3 and T4. So I want, I'm going to make you, this is probably the only time in your life you're even going to ever need to know these words, but I'm going to make you do it. That's the meaty side of me. So instead of just knowing T3, T4, you're going to need to know spell it all out. I'm going to ask you, like, what's the long name for T3 and T4? So here we go. So if we have T4, it's going to be, I'm going to write this in different colors because I have a point that I'm trying to make here. Tetra, here, red pen, iodo, thyronine. And so we're going to draw it. So T4 has this thyronine backbone. And because it's T4, it has four iodines. So that's the T4. Tetra, iota, thyroid. That's what it looks like. And then for T3, we would have T3, it would be tri iota, thyroid, and so on. And so T3 would be that. So pretty simple. So we've all most um, some sort of thyroid issue is fairly common anymore. So we probably don't have yeah, some sort of thyroid issue. So you measure T3, T4, and if someone's deficient, then they will have their T4, T3, T4 supplemented. And usually people are familiar that oh, T3 is the more active form compared to T4, and it's the one that's really having a greater impact on some of the symptoms management, you know, increase their metabolism and so on. So think of T4 as being the cell, the, the thyroid gland is making more of the T4. It's a stable version. It's a more stable version for it to leave the thyroid gland and just travel through the body. And then it's at the level of the cells that the cells then say, hey, I really need T3 to rev up my, my mitochondria and really boost this metabolism action going. So thanks for bringing me T4. And when I bring it into the cell, I'm going to clip an iodine. So now I made my own T3 just to burn it. So T4 is just kind of a nice, stable delivery method, but T3 tends to be the more usable one. Clinically, people feel like they're getting more symptom management if the medication they're taking has more T3 because it's sort of set and ready to go. So I'm going to tell you, there, tell you a scenario that may or may not be such a good thing. So what we should know here is basically from the thyroid gland, T3, T4 is something to help boost your metabolism. But there is an exception. So I'm just going to go forward a moment, then we'll come back to the calcitonin story. So this here is a slide here I have of your T4 that I've drawn here. And say normally, and I can't remember exactly which one it is, but in normal T3, the cell is going to cleave off an iodine, so it makes itself a T3, and think of it as a gas pedal. It's going to rev up your mitochondria, rev up your metabolism, allow you to make ATP a little bit more efficiently, and so there you are, you're rolling people. Um, and so if you are doing that, then you're going to be more sluggish, not making much energy, and kind of feeling colder and so on. So T3 normally is going to boost your metabolism. However, there are some circumstances where T3 is actually going to be the break and it's doing the opposite of what you expect it to do. Where in those circumstances usually involve some sort of stress, but because stress is different for one person than it would be for another, its triggers can be a little less definitive across the person. So it's more of the example of Here's this person, I did the blood work, they have all this hypothyroid symptoms. You know, they're feeling cold and sluggish, but their blood levels show they got plenty of T3. They should be fine. There is nothing wrong with you. Your blood levels are fine. Just go home. You know, but they're really feeling hypothyroid. So what's happening very likely in that person is they're at the cellular level. They're must be under some sort of stress for whatever, whatever stress is for that person. 
that when you have to think, think of ourselves in a biological sense, when our bodies are experiencing sort of this ambiguous and overused term of stress, we go in defense mode. Like, we won't, are we preparing for war? Are we like hitting starvation? Are we, we, what are, we don't know, you know, so our bodies are pretty primitive in its response. And so they, it will actually say, you know what, we're stressed, let's conserve. Do we want to expend extra energy? No, we need to be in save mode, we need to be hunkered down, buckle down mode. And so that's where the cell says, I'm getting this T4, and I'm really stressed out, and I don't think we need to be expending extra energy. I'm going to clip this one instead. And what happens is they found that a very specific, it's very precise with regards to which iodine is removed, that it's going to either increase metabolic rate or decrease it. So the wrong one, if you will, is called reverse T3. So the same patient that has this, like, you're fine, your blood levels are fine, you have plenty T3, just go home, you know, is you could then ask, or they would should then do a follow-up test and say, can I have my T3 evaluated by a normal T3 or do I have reverse T3? And that would then help answer some of those questions. Is that not normal practice to check if they do the reverse? Not always. They would not do that. I think it used to, when I first started talking about this, coming across the literature, like right around like 2000, 2001, it was starting to be more aware and then I think it was a year or two later I was talking about in class and a student said hey I work at you know lab core and we, we do this test so it's available it's not like some weird esoteric test they have to kind of go somewhere else but it's not always on the standard front line list you can check your T3, T4 you're good you know but and so it's really that second follow up visit that you like hey we need to drill down a little bit more because they weren't what we expected. So that's, that's that. So I wanted to, so I don't really want to over, again, I don't want to spend a lot of time on pathology here, but I have one plus question that is about it. So when you see, I want you to think T3, T4 always leads to something to boost your metabolism, but the one exception, reverse T3 is going to slow it down. So just so that it's in your consciousness, you sort of have an awareness of that. Okay. So, and on your test, I will ask you, Hey, give me the name for T3 or T4. But then I've had some very clever students. I'm not saying it's annoying to do it, but at the same time, I think, um, where they've written on the test of like, write me the whole name for T4. And then they write this. And they write thyroxine. And then I remember seeing that one. All right. It is thyroxine too, but I'm looking for this one. But so that is another name, just so you're aware of it have it. Yeah, T4 aka thyroxine. So it's probably more commonly known as thyroxine. You'll hear that, but it's the same as T4. So, um, no, that's Okay, back to the calcitonin. So, before we go back to calcitonin, recap, what cells in the thyroid gland make T3, T4? Follicular cells. Yeah, they're the ones that make the circle. Exactly. Okay, so then we're going to talk about calcitonin that comes from which cells? Parafollicular. Because the prefix para means alongside. So we have para alongside or next to. So these guys, these parafollicular cells make calcitonin, and what calcitonin does is it's going to lower, drop down our blood calcium. It has nothing to do with metabolism. So it's like two kind of just cells doing different things, it's happening to be in the thyroid gland. So parafollicular cells are going to make calcitonin, which is going to lower our blood calcium levels. So, and our body likes to view things from the blood perspective. So it says, hey, we have way too much calcium, let's lower it. And so what it does is at first, it's sort of like you at home going, you know what, I spent way too much money over here. I got cash everywhere. I, where am I going to put it? In a store. Let me take to the bank. So what is the calcium bank of our body? Our bones. So calcitonin will lower it from the blood and send it out into the bones in our calcium bank. So there's actually a medication called calcitonin that people that have osteoporosis will take to help promote calcium movement into the bones. But, that, but when you think of it from the body perspective, the body just says, hey, we have too much calcium in our blood. We're gonna first send it to our bones 
But you know what? Hey, gut, could you just not absorb any more calcium? Because, you know, we have too much. And, oh, by the way, kidneys, we have too much calcium, too. So could you just pee extra out? So calcitonin, although does try to promote calcium uptake into the bones, it's also reducing your intake and you're bringing it into your body. So it's not only what you want if you have osteoporosis, and it's actually increasing your excretion of it as well. Because it's, you're having to look at it from the body's perspective, not from the bone. The bone's just the bank. Um, so that's one thing to be made aware of. So I'm going to go on to some T3, T4 pathology before we come to the other side, the other half of the equation for the calcium. So with regard to T3 and T4, so I'm sort of switching back and forth here, we have um, a hyperthyroidism. There's Graves disease and there's iodine deficiency coiter. One means it's hyperthyroidism where you're feeling the effects of an excessive amount of thyroid um, a thyroid T3, T4, or you have a goiter because you don't, you're getting the effects of hyperthyroidism. And so some people are like, how can we have a goiter for both of them? Well, in Graves' disease, it's just an overproduction. You're just thyroid gland, it's going like mad, making more, and your body's responding because it's getting more. But in the iodine deficiency goiter, in our little schematic that we had here, what are we missing? Iodine. So if we have our little box here, and we're supposed to have a bunch of iodine sticking off of here. And you're in an area, off in a third world country, where you don't have enough iodine in your body. Your thyroid gland's making that. And it's making T1. And it's making T2. And your cells are like, I can't do anything. I can't use that. So in the iodine deficiency goiter scenario, the cells are still demanding T3, T4. Tells the hypothalamus, hey, we are low metabolism. Hypothalamus sends a releasing hormone to the pituitary. Pituitary sends out thyroid stimulating hormone, targets the follicular cells. It sends out more of what it thinks is T3, T4, but it's really this crap. And then the cells are like, I can't use it. So hypothalamus, we still need to boost it. So you can see where the production becomes increased because it's being driven from the hypothalamus and pituitary gland to make more, but what it's making is defunct. So it would be like, say, you know, an automobile manufacturer. They're making, say, Ford pickups, and they're delivering them to the place. It only has two wheels on it. No one's going to be buying those. And so then the dealership's going to order more, and they keep ordering more, and they like, nope, I guess we're getting the bad pickups again. Let's order more. And the factory thinks business is good, so they expand, and they get bigger, and they hire more workers, and they're making more. And that's what the goiter is, is the thyroid gland overworking, making more. But the body is, like, not getting their appropriate products. So that's the difference there. Um, hypothyroidism, where we have a Hashimoto situation, where we're attacking follicular cells, so you're not making enough. So... Both Graves' disease and Hashimoto's are an autoimmune. One's just making too much, and this one's not making enough. So then it'll be supplemented with that. So in this picture, we can see this person has Graves' disease, and we notice that because of the eyes. Um, one of the hallmarks of Graves' disease is a swelling and enlargement of the muscles, the ocular muscles. So within the orbits of our skull, it's a pretty limited space. So when those muscles enlarge and are filled with fluid, it causes the eyes to protrude forward. So that's one of the symptoms of it. And then you can see a square here. That's just out of double. This one's third world country. Um, that's the iodine deficiency goiter. And so you don't see that. Well, our salt here, goodness knows that we all eat plenty of salt. So you know, if you're a cardiovascular physiologist, you know salt's like an excess. But our salt here is iodized. So we, you would really never see that. That would be extremely unusual if that was the case. Um, but we do see that around here. So this is just a way for me to go back through and help you understand a negative feedback loop. Just kind of, and the thyroid gland is one of the more complicated ones. So on the left side is sort of like the benchmarks that you see in the textbook. You have stimulus and you have like series. So on the right is more specifically what we now know is happening. So it's a pretty wordy slide. So I'm just going to more talk it through. So if you have low metabolism, the hypothalamus detects it. Hypothalamus is going to send a releasing hormone down to the anterior pituitary. 
anterior pituitary says, okay, I'm going to send thyroid stimulating hormone to come here to the thyroid gland in the neck. And then the thyroid gland says, I'm going to release T3 and T4 out to the whole body. The cells say, thank you, because they have the good T3, T4, not that one I have up there. And the metabolism goes back up, it gets raised, and then the hypothalamus detects that again and says, things are good, let me send out a thyroid inhibiting hormone and tell the thyroid gland to stop releasing. So that, that is our complex negative feedback loop. It's complex because we're going from hypothalamus, and we have a pituitary gland, and we have a thyroid. So like a two gland or kind of one. But I, it still follows the same kind of, you know, basic pattern. Here. So here's another schematic. I was playing around with this when I should have been paying attention to the meeting. I should have been paying attention to the but I made that instead. So if you have low T3, T4 levels, you're low energy. The hypothalamus detects it, thyrotropin releasing hormones, what it's actually called. That's when it gets sent down the hypophysial portal system to the anterior pituitary. The anterior pituitary then decides it will then be asked to send out thyroid stimulating hormone. That's going to then target the thyroid gland, specifically the follicular cells within that thyroid gland. And it's those cells that are going to send out T3 and T4 throughout the whole body. And then, therefore, our energy levels are restored, normal levels, and therefore, then we have the inhibiting hormone that goes there and we stop thyroid stimulating So that's it in the less wordy form. I was looking at my slides and went, oh, this is just a hideous slide. I remember like lots of reports. So that's why he's like, look at the words that you have something to study at that home, but maybe just listen to you know what I'm saying to get it in your head. So then the words of it just look like, you know, scramble the letters on the page. So parathyroid gland. So the thyroid gland and the parathyroid gland are two totally different glands. The parathyroid just needed a place to live. So the thyroid, we talked about it being like a bow tie that wraps around your airway. So if we were to go have this little bow tie and I'm facing forward, and if I'm going to turn around, face backwards, and then take my skull off and my everything off, this is the back side of that bow tie. And the yellow dots in this little cartoon are the four little parathyroid glands that are embedded in the thyroid gland itself. So I like this histology slide um, because you can definitely see the parathyroid gland is histologically distinct from the thyroid gland. I love this slide because I do think the slide emphasizes how the parathyroid is indeed embedded within the thyroid that there are chief cells. There's actually two types of cells, but we're just going to only need to know about chief cells. The chief cells make easy peasy parathyroid hormone. So this is one of our easy glands. One, don't even make you know a histology slide on it. And two, the parathyroid gland makes parathyroid hormone. Oh, that's nice. One last kind of crazy word to learn about. So what does parathyroid hormone do? It is the yin and yang to calcitonin. So we already learned about how calcitonin from the parafollicular cells of the thyroid gland lower blood calcium levels and send it to the bones. Parathyroid hormone set is also from the perspective of the blood, says we need calcium, we have blood clotting issues, we need to have muscle contraction, we have nerve stimulus, we need cofactors in the liver. We use calcium for a lot of things in our body. In order just to live every day, we need calcium to get stuff done. And if you're not consuming it in an appropriately absorbable form, then the parathyroid hormone says, we need to do work. So parathyroid gland sends out parathyroid hormone, and it's going to make a withdrawal from the calcium bank. That would be the bones to raise our blood calcium levels so that we can keep our main body housekeeping going. So we tend to use more parathyroid hormone than we do calcitonin. We tend to sort of be in more need on a general basis than we are in excess. And I mentioned an appropriately usable form of calcium. So I spend a little more time about this when we talk about it um, with regards to bone physiology. And I was just updating my bone lecture. So I thought I had it here, but I don't. So the although milk has a high amount of calcium in it it really isn't your best source of calcium that's usable to your body 
So my best friend, she hates milk. And so she's got, she's kind of like got this sort of weird calcium fetish, it seems like. Like she's paranoid about osteoporosis. Just because ever since she was little, I think her mom must have said, you're going to have bad bones if you don't drink your milk or something. And she hates milk. And so she's like weirdly obsessed with taking and anything that has calcium and eating tons and this Viagra stuff and all of this. And she's chewed this like crazy. I'm like, I need that all the time. She's like, I don't like milk. I've got to get my calcium somewhere. Well, that is not the ideal place. And in fact, Walter Willett from Harvard, he was the main researcher behind all the women's health initiative studies. But some of the studies he was involved in looked at osteoporosis and calcium intake. And the countries that had the highest per capita milk intake in the US and Holland, I believe, we call them beat us out actually for per capita, had the greatest amount of osteoporosis, rates of osteoporosis. And the countries with the lowest milk consumption actually have the least amount of osteoporosis. So milk is not the answer. Now, I'm a big fan of milk, so I'm not trying to, like, I want some dairy lobbyists coming after me here or anything mm -hmm. like that. But, um, and so, but there are better sources. And in fact, getting your calcium is a lot more effective if you get it with its friend, magnesium, in a two to one ratio. So calcium, magnesium being absorbed together. They're both cations, and they both have two pluses at the end. Get all the chemistry out here, guys. So the best sources really are some of our leafier green vegetables. So you know, you want your calcium, you know, I'll tell my friend AJ, be like, don't worry about your glass of milk, but here's some spinach. Enjoy. Um, that's a better alternative or not, but you may not like that much like milk, but there are good alternatives. So I want to rest easy anybody out there that hates milk or fine milk or, or even kids that don't want to have milk and cereals and stuff, don't think that you're gonna compromise their bones. There's plenty of better sources um, and that are surprisingly people going to be associated with some of the um, vegetable sources. So, okay, that's not on your test, that's my little sidebar. <laughs> okay, back to reality here. So, our reality here is what's oh, the thyroid and parathyroid? Where are they? Neck. Thyroid's a bow tie, parathyroid's just stuck on the back side of it. There's four of them. Um, what hormones are we getting produced from the thyroid gland? T3, T4. T3, T4. And calcitonin. What's T3, T4 do? Great metabolism. What's calcitonin do? Lower blood calcium. Yep. Parathyroid gland. What hormone does it produce? Parathyroid hormone. So I hope nobody gets that one. Okay, so make parathyroid hormone. What does it do? Raises blood calcium levels. Exactly. And what about this reverse T3? What does that do? Decreases metabolism. So it's not common, it's extremely unusual, but it's something that can happen. So it's one of those that um, you just want to be aware of. Um, thyroid pathology would just be an excessive amount of thyroid, could be um, Graves' disease, or um, you have Graves' disease, which is an autoimmune, or you can have Hashimoto's thyroiditis, which is one of the most, the most common um, thyroid concerns. Uh, could you touch on the oxyphosis? So don't worry about them. They're in there, and when we're doing histology, but we're not going to talk about them. They know about them. So we don't know what they do. And then the pathology, just know there's autoimmune. And autoimmune, like, could be for Graves. We're actually having hyper thyroid. Or you can have an autoimmune like Hashimoto's, and you have hypo. So just because someone has their immune system attacking them, it can make it go like haywire on higher direction. Um, and then you say the parathyroid glands know about the calcium levels. So if your calcium levels are too low, you're not bringing enough into your mouth, then parathyroid hormones can become active and withdraw from your bone bank. Okay. And people get that, get that so far? Adrenal gland and pancreas. We're going to run through this one here. So we're going to go through the adrenal glands. Now the adrenal glands look quite nice in this cartoon schematic that we have here. The adrenal glands look nice and plump, and there's like a nice cortex with a medulla. So cortex, I always like to think of cortex as crust, and the medulla as middle. And so the adrenal gland, in a really, just probably a stupid way to remember it, but I remember it this way, is like a jelly donut. And the donut part that goes above and below is going to be the cortex, and the jelly's in the middle. And the reason why I make that analogy is when students are looking at the adrenal glands during our histology part of the lab, people, students will be looking and they imagine it like a lot of the pictures that are drawn in the book where they show 
the cortex and the medulla way here at the bottom. But so a student might be zoomed in and then they start looking down, scanning down, and they're trying to look for the medulla. So they go down, down, down in the slide. But what they're actually doing in the slide is this. They're scanning through and they're now way over here and they're like, oh, now this must be the medulla. So I'm like, if you think about like a jelly donut, you're like donut part and you just went through the jelly and now you're back on the donut on the other side. And so students sort of forget the cortex or the crust is at the bottom as well. So that's why it's a ridiculous analogy. So, but they're also, the drawings obviously are more idealized. So when we dissect our cadavers here and we open it, we move the intestines across and we see the peritoneal cavity, we actually see the little capsule that the kidneys are tucked back in behind the peritoneum. We cut it open, we see the kidney there, like, oh, is there going to be a adrenal glands? And you really don't see anything, it doesn't look like that at all. It's just the, like some connected tissue that you're like, oh, well, I don't know, it's like some blobbed up stuff there, and I think the adrenal glands in here. And it just looks just like a net. It's, so it's not as nicely distinctive as we have here. So it's very idealized. We have a new cadaver. I don't think we've gotten that far. So we'll have to see if we, this one has. I'm not holding my breath for it. So in the, the 18 years I've been here, I haven't seen a decent adrenal gland. So we tend to get people at the later stages of their lives, so I don't know if that has anything to do with it, so we get to it, but they don't look as good. So enjoy the drawing pictures. So this is the histology image of the adrenal glands, and so you can see this one's a rat one, I believe, and so you can see a nice kind of cortex making a circle, and then this number five area is obviously the adrenal medulla. In this case, it's a little more oval, side to side, a little more oblong, and one is actually just connective tissue capsule, two, three, and four, are the adrenal cortex, five is the adrenal medulla, and then we have up above, we have cortex here too. So you can kind of see it, someone were to look at a slide and they were at the cortex, they're trying to go down to the bottom, they might just pass through the medulla. So, again, so the adrenal gland, so we've been pretty easy so far. When we see the histology slide of a pituitary gland, we only have to see two sides, right? Anterior poster. And then when we see the histology slide of a thyroid gland, we're going to see all circles. So we need to identify follicular cells and parafollicular cells. And now in this histology slide of the adrenal gland, we're only going to need to see and identify the two parts, the adrenal cortex and the adrenal medulla. But So that's the easy part. But this is where I get kind of mean, because now I make you know this. This part is the hard part. So this is harder and more involved than the other glands are. So this is where the adrenal gland becomes difficult. So the easy part is just the slide of cortex or medulla. But what I do want you to know is that in the, within the cortex there are three subsections. And it's within these three subsections that you're going to need to know a couple of layers more of detail than, you, than the other ones. So if we have a an adrenal gland here, and we have our medulla here, And then we have our adrenal cortex. Adrenal cortex is out there. Within the adrenal cortex, so this here is a zoomed up view of like just this section here. We're just showing you like the, the medulla is quite small, but we have a bigger cortex. So sort of just zoomed in here. So what we have is on the outer portion of the cortex, we have what's known as zona glomerulosa. And then just in from that, we have zona fasciculata. And just in from that, but before we get to the medulla, we have zona reticularis. 
So they are all part of the adrenal cortex. On a histology slide, I'm going to back up to here. When you see something like this, if my pointer is pointing to here, you don't have to say zona fasciculata, just say zona of the adrenal cortex. So visually, on a slide, you only have to identify it by cortex and medulla. But then intellectually, you have to know about the subsets, because then I will say, name the zona from the outermost to the innermost. So that's this order here. And then I'm going to say, tell me the family of hormones that it produces. And then I'm going to say, tell me the main hormone from that family. So we're going to we'll continue our little part here. So we have zona glomerulosa makes mineral corticoids. And the zona fasciculata makes glucocorticoids. And zona reticularis makes um, androgens, sex hormones, but mostly on the androgen side of things. So zone, the mineral corticoids, there's many of them. So that's why we call it a family of hormones. But the most prevalent the one that you would know or need to know more about would be, and so say the representative hormone for of mineral corticoids would be aldosterone. And the main hormone of the glucocorticoid family, again, there's lots of them, um, but the main one that you'll be asked about for our purpose of our test and just need to have associated with it is going to be cortisol. And zona reticularis makes mostly androgens. That's more on the body building side, growth side, muscle building side, more on the male characteristic side of things of sex hormones. It also can make estrogen or provide a person with estrogen. For instance, menopausal women that's not getting estrogen from their ovaries still get some of their sex hormones from their adrenal glands. So it does do that. But the main one of this group I would associate would be testosterone. So back to the reality of our class is on a practical exam, the histology slide would just be adrenal cortex, adrenal medulla. And then the follow-up question. So there's not, you don't have to worry about where I'm pointing you exactly. Is it still medulla or is it still, you know, reticular or the fasciculata? It's just, it's just too hard to see, you know, when one zone ends. So I don't care about that, but you just know that order. And then the questions would be, you know, on the practical, very frequently, I just have something exactly like this, where there's just nine blank lines. Name the zona, name the hormone family, name the main hormone from that. So that would really be it. Or um, And then where do they belong? Like mineral corticoids are produced by what zona? That might be like one of the multiple choice questions. So the multiple choice question, not even on the practical. Or the main mineral corticoid would be you know, A, aldosterone, B, cortisol, C, testosterone, and me making up like insulin, like throwing in some other random hormones. So there are certainly a number of questions, but that's not either a family of hormones or cortisol comes from which family of hormones, you know, like the glucocorticoid, corticoid, or cortisol is produced by which zona. So this is probably the, this is the hardest part, I think, of kind of what we've gone through. So point that out to This is not to scare the pants out of you or not to make you think this is a chemistry class or anything, but this is just to show you kind of the full circle here. What we have in blue are our androgens, and then the androgens can easily convert over into our estrogens. So that would be something that's being produced down here. Um, the lateral side to side are our mineral corticoids, and you can see some of a couple of our glucocorticoids. I mean, there's obviously just this is a very summarized, abbreviated form. There's many more hormones out here, 
but you can see where they're what related, but they're two different families. And um, so really, they are all part of our little chicken wire diagram. They are part, they are actually all with the thyroid hormones. So just to kind of full circle back to where we started with this chapter, when we talked about water soluble hormones and lipid soluble hormones, with regard to that section of our lecture, I just care that you understand the mechanism. Which one's traveling through the membrane? Lipid soluble. Which one's hitting a receptor but never enters a cell, but only goes to the receptor? So again, I still am going to use testosterone or estrogen as the representative example of your lipid soluble hormone. But intellectually, just at the back of your head, I want you to realize that all of these really are falling in that family. And indeed, when we have excessive production of one of these hormones, and cortisol is probably the most common one that we would have here, it's associated with an insufficient production of another one. So one simple example would be, most people are familiar with um, female athletes, whether they're gymnasts or runners. I uh, minor guidance at the University of Oregon, big runner in school. Uh, um, and so it's very, very common for female athletes, especially in the peak of their training, to not menstruate, not have their cycles. And so and then when they're in the off season or you know, maybe eating more or they not train as hard and their cycles resume. It's really not that big of a deal. But what's going on is that female's body says, hey, we're Perhaps either we're so stressed or we're not consuming enough calories or we're straight training so hard that we don't think we have the resources to actually funnel to maybe making somebody new right now. So we don't have those resources. So we're just going to lower our hormones in that area to a level that we're not going to cycle. So we don't have that option because we're driving it in other areas, higher stress, higher things. So those are the things that is more of a preservation for that organism, if you want to think of it from that perspective. So it's more or less about talking about stress and menstrual cycles, we'll be able to talk about that in unit four, is more about understanding the balance. When you have higher levels of stress and cortisol, you're going to get lower levels, in this case would be estrogen in some places, and then it balances out. So we're all, it's all a web. So sometimes we get so worried about what we're deficient in, sometimes we want to think about what are we excessive in too, because it's, again, they're connected. So that's just all this is sort of tied to. Um, there's not a lot from this slide I really care that you know. It's more of a connecting it back to our adrenal corticotropic hormone from the pituitary gland, um, from the anterior pituitary, and is now targeting, now that we can better appreciate, it's actually targeting zona the fasciculata, and it's associated with the higher level of stress hormone of cortisol. So that's all it is. And here's just something to point out. Not necessarily on the test is the body effects of the adrenal cortex um, and specifically cortisol is it's going to cause it's allowing for you to handle transient stress we're really not designed for chronic stress and that's where this overused word of stress comes into play is our bodies are designed to be faced with some issue some foe or some sort of problem we become stressed out we respond to it we handle it and we recover there's a resolution phase. Life, sort of as many of us live it, there is no resolution phase, and that's where stress becomes pathological. So in this, so if you're dealing with a normal scenario, you're going to have immune suppression. Your body says, you know what? We're not going to worry about fighting antigens. We're going to send our energies to fighting and responding to whatever the stress is. Um, Anti-inflammatory properties go with that. We also have increased blood glucose. Let's mobilize our energy. But at the same time, let's tell our cells to maybe spare it a little bit because we don't know how long we're going to be fighting this foe. And let's mobilize fatty acids to get more ATP made from this. So if we're in a chronic stress, not we're responding to something and we're going to resolve it, the non-resolution, like how many people live their lives all the time, whether, you know, you guys all were here at work, you guys are at school learning, then you have to go home and study, you got to pick up kids, you're going to eat dinner, and you're like, you know, life never ends. So it's one of those things that there's no resolution. You had a birthday party the other day, you're probably like cleaning the house still from that. And so, you know, we had all that. So you're mobilizing it. So in a chronic basis, can you see how stress actually contributes to diabetes? We're actually mobilizing glucose, but also inherently causing it to reduce. That's basically what diabetes is doing. We're also mobilizing free fatty acids. We're increasing free fatty acids, triglycerides in the blood as well. So that's where 
chronic stress becomes problematic. But transient stress with a resolution is actually quite healthy and we're really quite well equipped to do that. We're just not equipped for the chronic stuff. Okay, so let's move on into the medulla. The medulla, it's within here we're making norepinephrine and regular epinephrine, also known as adrenaline and noradrenaline. So this should be old hat to you because you did this in 201 with the power of the sympathetic nervous system. When you're stimulating the sympathetic nervous system, um, remember the two-step pathway where you have the first nerve coming off the central nervous system, releasing acetylcholine onto the second nerve that then would then release norepinephrine onto the whatever tissue it's going to. This is the second step without a nerve. It actually is the first step pathway coming in here and telling it to say release norepinephrine ep epinephrine into the blood. And then now we have circulating norepinephrine and that helps our heart rate is going to accelerate to be sustained over a longer <clears> period <throat> of time. So that's why when you get scared or nervous, even if the issue is over with, you still have to take the long time for it to clear out of your body. So that's it for the adrenal gland. So let's do a quick recap. Adrenal gland located on top of the kidneys. Two parts, the cortex and the medulla. The medulla is the easy part. So it just has norepinephrine and epinephrine. It's an um, extension of the sympathetic nervous system. The cortex is the hard part. We have zona. We have families of hormones. And each family has its main representative, if you will, or the main hormone from that. You should know those. Okay. Any questions? Any okay, the pancreas. Can you move on to the pancreas and get this out of the way? The pancreas is a totally different gland, and I feel like I have to say that because enough people on the test will get these mixed up. So the pancreas, also located in the abdominal region, is located right below the of the stomach coming down to the stomach and the pancreas if you look at the stomach the pancreas can't kind of tuck underneath it and the head of the pancreas is the cupped here in this portion shaped portion of the first part of the small intestine and so it does that because the main job for the pancreas is actually to create a lot of digestive enzymes that get dumped into the small intestine it makes that enzyme that will digest carbohydrates, it can digest fats, it can digest proteins. So that is its main job. Hey, you have food, got processed by the stomach, that's not in this picture. The stomach processes it, dumps it into the duodenum that is located here. Hey, pancreas, send us some digestive enzymes so we can finish off digestion of food so the rest of the intestine can absorb it. That is the main job of the pancreas. So that is its exocrine function. Remember, exocrine is exiting, it's going out. So exit means it's being made here and going out as it's following the duct to go out into the space. So then, but what system we're studying? Endocrine. So it has endocrine function too. So in the histology here of the pancreas, I kind of want, I'm going to point out what you shouldn't notice, which is really bad teaching technique here, of course. So if we're looking at the pancreas here, and it's like a big, ugly purple carpet, if you will, think of it. So this darker purple area, that is the acini. The acini are cellular elements that make the digestive enzymes. So I'm going to toggle back. So the acini out here, they dump their digestive enzymes into the duct so the duct can bring it over here, right? So we have to have a duct. That's the duct. I'm not drawing very well with my finger, but the duct actually, so it's just that is something on this slide to just ignore because it's really not a cell. But I wanted to show you because it's a circle, a big white circle, and it sort of draws your attention to it. So all it is is a duct for the acini to dump its digestive enzymes in there so it's traveling to your small intestine. Then we think over here, what's this stuff? This stuff here is okay. so we actually have a vein here and an artery. Arteries are a little thicker than veins. 
So over here are blood vessels. All of our glands are going to have blood vessels. We have to dump the hormones into somewhere. Plus, that tissue needs to get its own blood supply. So that is another area that you don't need to worry about that we're not going to identify. The final area that we do need to know is this number one. This area is known as, I'll try it up here in way, islet of, islet of Langerhans, also known as pancreatic islets. You'll see in the textbooks, I'm giving you the other term because you'll see that, I don't want you to think it's another thing to look for in here. So they're really the same, pancreatic islets or islet of Langerhans. Um, now that I've pointed out all the things that you're going to know, let's do some decent teaching. You need to know ACE and I. What do ACE and I do? Make digestive enzymes. Make digestive enzymes. Make digestive enzymes. And then the other thing that you need to know is this guy here, and that's going to be your pancreatic islet or your islet of your hands. And that is going to be what we're going to talk about next. Next, next. So exocrine was the acinine, and now the endocrine part, that's our chapter, are our islet of your hands. So we'll go through here. So this here, the pancreas endocrine cells are coming from the islet of your hands, or pancreatic islet, however you want to refer to it. We have... Um, yeah, so if we have pancreas tissue, well, I'm going to draw kind of a weird pancreas. So if our pancreas kind of looks like this, it's a weird leaf. It has a duct through the middle, it's a pancreatic duct that's going to go here into the small intestine. So mostly it's filled with acini, digestive enzymes, dumps it in the duct and out into here. Then we have these little patches. They're really not on the gross anatomy of this. They're in the histology section here, but I'll sort of draw them as these sort of sporadic patches. So these here would be I would have my hands. And in those islet of Langer hands, we have two types of cells. You're not going to be able to visually see them. Just know in that patch area, that number one area there, they're going to be there. So the cells that we have in there are going to be alpha cells. Alpha cells are going to make the hormone glucagon. What glucagon does it's glucagon is going to increase our blood glucose levels. Blood glucose. And then we have the beta cells. Beta cells are going to make insulin. And insulin decreases our blood glucose. So, if, for instance, you decided to have jelly beans for breakfast, which would be popular in my house. I wasn't there, probably, or on occasions when I'm not there. I was the other day, and get in there, and I see Lucky Charms sitting on the table. I'm like, what? That is weekend cereal. So, like, send my kids to school, I hopped up on sugar, and then they're all passed out or grumpy by the time. 930 rolls around. Um, so what happens is if you have intake something of real simple sugars, things that break down quite easily. So it's not always about the carbohydrate. Again, I think most people are educated enough now to realize it's the complex carbs, which is simple carbs. Um, and so the sugars break down so quickly. So it's really not always the amount of carbohydrate you get, but the type. And so really you want it, the type to be more complex. So it's like meters it out. So when it gets absorbed into your body, you're getting just a little bit at a time. You're just getting it here, like, you know, drip, drip. That's sort of why it's with something like oatmeal or something that's going to be a little bit better, especially if you have like the, the 
harder because you're kind of able to feel like that that's it. That's the better one, so take the longer processes. You might have the same amount of carbs as you would the Lucky Charms, you know, but you're getting it at a slower rate. So that's the critical element. So what happens is you'll get this glucose, this glucose goes up high into your bloodstream. Your eyelid line, your hands say, red alert, we've got higher glucose level, above our normal levels. Okay, beta cells, why don't you send out some insulin? Insulin circulates, it takes your glucose, it goes around the cells, binds that surface receptor, because it's a water-soluble hormone, binds the surface receptor, says cells, take in some of this glucose, take it in. And then the cells do, and then finally they're like, we're full, we don't need any more. There's still more glucose. You still have, you ate more for breakfast, maybe you did two bowls, you know, and so you've got more going, so then the insulin goes to the liver and says, hey, could you make glycogen? It's sort of like glucose, which is blood sugar, in this storage form, and just kind of save it for us for a little bit. It's sort of like when you go grocery shop, instead of the groceries all over your counter, so now you just put it in the pantry. It's real easy, easy access, but just kind of out of the way. So it's out of the blood, stored now, we got it in the liver, and then, you know, still have more glucose around, then you need longer term storage, and longer term storage would be places like, you know, our bellies and our rear ends, and that would be our fat, or wherever we all tend to store, make our, we all have room, like storage depots. So then, you know, finally blood glucose goes down to normal levels, okay, we're all happy now, and then later, you start to get hungry, blood glucose levels start to drop, blood glucose levels drop, I will lay your hand and say, uh oh, lower normal than normal blood glucose levels, Alpha cells send out glucagon. Glucagon goes to the liver and says, hey, remember that stuff we put in the storage, the glycogen, that was our pantry? Could we break it down and make blood glucose? Blood glucose levels rise, and now we're back to normal. Comes back here and it shuts it off here. Again, with the feedback loop once it's back to normal and it stops secreting it. So one is going to manage it to lower it if you had high blood glucose levels like after breakfast, and glucagon is going to manage you between meals, increase your blood glucose levels until you can then eat again. So that is that. So if, for instance, you're going to like another example of, not a great example, but say you're going to have a bagel. Say I have, you know, carbs. Both, say both my kids have a bagel. And one kid's like, I just want a bagel. Don't give me anything else. So they have whatever carbs they have there. Then the other kid wants a bagel. Like, Mom, could you put cream cheese on it? You know, maybe you throw some salmon on it. They really want to get get crazy with it. And so, same amount of carbs, in essence, we'll just ignore the carbs and stuff like that. But basically, same carbs, what's going to happen is the kid with the plain bagel is going to spike and crash sooner. For the other one, the stomach, from the stomach perspective, says, oh, you just gave me some carbs, but I have other stuff to do. I have to digest the fats, and I have to digest the proteins, and well, it's not good at doing the proteins, but it's got more work to do. So basically, what it sends out to the small intestine is now metered out. And so you took a simple car, which was the bagel, and actually slowed down the rate that it's going to be presented to your body in essence. So in the sense of insulin regulation, that's going to be a better choice. Now we can have an argument on whether it's you know, saturated fats and move on like that, but in essence, without changing much as far as carb number. So it's not always about what's the number I'm looking at, it's the type and how it's being presented to your body, but it's more of a concern. Okay, let's talk about diabetes. So diabetes type one used to be called juvenile diabetes because it was presented in people when they were young. And so what it is is an autoimmune that's attacking the beta cells. So these beta cells start getting attacked by your body so you're not making enough um, insulin, and therefore those people have to have an insulin pump and be given supplemental insulin because they're not able to, they can eat the food, but the glucose isn't going to go anywhere. It's not going to go into the cells unless it has insulin and their body's not making it. Type 2 diabetes, though, is over time, and it really is about the desensitized, desensitized insulin receptors. What type 2 diabetes is, is in the scenario where I said, okay, we had our lucky charms, glucose shoots up, insulin goes out, you know, and then puts it away. So what if you're not just lucky charms, what if you're a kid that's sitting there, um, I don't know, maybe not even a kid, 
uh, person that drinks with those tall drinks, like a big tall, like when I was a kid, we had several of us. They were the big gulps. So you like a big gulp of, you know, Coke or Mountain Dew, just a sugary drink. And so you think, okay, I got that. I'm just going to drink that all day long. It's not that bad, so I drink it all day. So but if you're drinking it all day, is it necessarily about the quantity or the quantity is everything? But at the same time, if you're just metering it all day, then think of it from the beta cell perspective. You take a couple sips, the beta cells go, oh, here comes the big surge of sugar. All right, send out insulin. Insulin goes out, hey, receptors, put the glucose away. A while later, another step comes. And so all day long, it's these like insulin surges that are happening that finally the receptor on the cell goes, oh, there you are again, insulin, both ignoring you. It will then, the glucose is there, insulin's there, binds the receptor, and the receptor is sort of not doing anything. It's not letting the glucose in. So then we still have high glucose, so the pancreas sends out more insulin, so now you have twice as much insulin out there, and finds the receptor, responds, and lets it in. So over time, it becomes desensitized. It's sort of like when you have kids. The first kid says, Mom, and you're like right on the, you know, by the time you have two or three, they might all be saying, Mom, and you're like, whatever. You might be talking to a friend, and they're like, um, Oh, they saying something? I don't know. I'm not hearing them. So <laughs> that is like an insulin receptor for type 2 diabetes. They're so desensitized and accustomed to it that they're not responding to it. So over time, the pancreas has to make more insulin and it eventually burns out. So somebody in later stages of type 2 diabetes, they are given insulin also. Of course, that's going to help them get through the day and get their glucose put away into their cells. But in the end, is that helping their condition? You can see how that actually exacerbating their condition. So when someone's taking insulin, some people have the mindset of, oh, I'm being treated. I'll be fine now. When they, they don't think about it, because we're so used to like, here's a pill, it's you're going to get better. So now they're being treated, but they're really going to be worse if they don't actively do something to try to reverse it. And so you take medications like metformin and things like that to resensitize, get those receptors to listen so they don't have to put so much insulin so that the body can do what it's meant to do. And so there's an, another one that you could do that resensitizes insulin receptors, mobilizes, actually boosts mood, causes better overall health in general, and much more off the charts, higher response than any of the um, metformins or any of the insulin desensitization drugs. And that literally is exercise, walking around the block. Doesn't mean to be crazy exercise, you have to go be, I'm not saying crazy, it is crazy. But you don't feel like the one of those CrossFitter people, if you're anti CrossFit, or like, oh, those people just make me tired watching that. You know, if you're one of those people, you don't have to do that. You could walk around the block, just move, because what the signal is, if you're from the perspective of the cell, you're inside and there's a cell, and there's your insulin receptor, and you're like, just insulin again. I'm ignoring him. Um, you're ignoring him because still you're sitting there. You're not doing anything. And you're like, you're just telling me to bring in glucose. I don't need it. But then if all of a sudden the person needs to move around and walk around, the cell goes, I actually have to make ATP now. I got to do something. Hey, maybe I want the glucose to come in. Hey, when insulin shows up to my receptor, I might listen to him now because I actually have a job to do now. By having your body do something, the signal for resensitization comes from within the cell that is 100 times more effective than any medication that you can jam on the outside of the cell forcing glucose to go in. So that is why it is critical. It's not just something to be like, less stress, more exercise. That's just like, wah, 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 white noise to people because it's so but it's very physiologically proven to actually be a benefit at this cellular level. And why it's so important to get This is probably why it was too simple, but like um, taking out decreasing sugar and things. Mm -hmm. So is that going to, since maybe they're not, the receptors don't have to work as often, are they going to get stronger? It's not they stronger. Are more sensitive? Yes. It will help yeah, desensitize them. Yes. So it's sort of like your kids, if they just stop being whiny, I'm not saying your kids, probably my kids. Oh, so my kids have... were less whiny, but we're using that example, so they're really not, so they're my kids are great. But you know, like that's where you like people ignore them, but then if all of a sudden they're quiet, and then like when they're like, hey mom, I'm like, what? Like because you don't hear the hundred times a day, you become resensitized. So that's the same as having less sugar. You're exposed to that when the sugar or the glucose is, your receptors are going to more likely to respond.
So in essence, we secure diabetes It is a very reversible. But oftentimes, people either don't catch it until um, it's so late that it's so, the cure is so outside of their you know, lifestyle and motivation. You know, so it's really that. So that is the most difficult thing to overcome because you really think, you know, I look at, you know, people in my family that have it that really are not in a position where, you know, you want, I think, exercise. I think one of the best gifts that we can give to our kids is just a love of movement and exercise. You don't have to make them like nutty workout freaks. Like, you know, I could be like some people are like, kids work out all the time or something. Like, you just want them to make that work. Actually, is kind of a fun and a stress reliever. You know, so I have friends where they're like, okay, I need to go to the gym and go work out. So they had a long day and they go to the gym and actually the workout is a stress to them because it's just another thing on my list to do. And it's like, is it as opposed to another friend of mine or like, oh, I just can't wait to the end of the day. I just go for a run, I've cleared my mind, I feel great. You know, so that's actually more physiologically beneficial, even if they burn the same number of calories. So the same thing, so the biggest gift you can give is really letting someone have something like movement and exercise be A, a relief, and something that they'd be inclined to do so that as opposed to the other way when they're older and have some sort of malady and pathology like you know eating a lot correctly then they're you know less likely to engage in activity like that so it's just really hard some of the lifestyles that we sort of embed into you know our kids and our families that lead up to that and makes it, it is reversible but you just have to kind of figure out who you're looking at here's our recap here and Adrenal cortex, we did the recap for that. The cortex, medulla on top of the kidneys. The cortex has the zona, the medulla is the extension of the sympathetic nervous system. Um, the pancreas, we make insulin or glucagon. We, it's the yin and yang as far as blood glucose. And um, the exocrine portion of the pancreas is going to be our acinite, secreting digestive enzymes, where the islet of Langer hands is the endocrine portion. Um, portion the cells I'm referring to alpha and beta so you are going to see test questions that I'll say beta cells come from where out of the your hands in the pancreas or beta cells produce what insulin or damage to your beta cells would cause you know problems with what hormone might be a way that would be phrased so that's what it means by cells and then pathology of insulin obviously diabetes so if you have a desensitization that's type 2 diabetes so the last gland that you need to know is the pineal gland. It is located also in the diencephalon, it's right above the thalamus. So it's known as the epithalamus, meaning above the thalamus. It's shaped a bit like, um, it's a bit like a sperm or a tadpole, if you want to think of it. There is tissue above the thalamus, but the bulk of it is on the posterior side. It is known as the third eye because it's responsive to light. So our retina, obviously their eyes, and it responds to light. But this, although we're not seeing, is sensitive to the presence or absence of light. And in fact, the absence of light is the bigger trigger here. So for instance, as we go into fall, we have longer nights, shorter days. That is a signal for some of the circadian rhythms throughout the year. When we think about circadian rhythm, we're so focused as humans as our day and night. Well, let's think of it from a bigger biology perspective. So if you have animals, you'll notice coming into fall, October, November, their coats are getting thicker in preparation for winter. Even if we're in still a warm place, maybe the weather's still staying warm, but the coats are gonna get thicker. It's not a response to the cold, it's a response to the longer nights and the changing of the seasons that melatonin is actually stimulating that type of production. Um, as well as even in the spring, sometimes we have late winters, but courses are shedding their hair early on and thinking, so kind of hold out. But again, it's a seasonal thing, less than a full thing. Um, breeding rituals for many animals so that they can breed a certain time of year so their offspring are born at times that are more optimal for their survival. So melatonin plays a role in those bigger things. For humans, we're all like, I am shift work or I just traveled from Europe and I'm changing time zones, so I need to take melatonin to straighten me out. Well, melatonin is a master hormone of lots of other hormones. You really don't want to mess with it. 
there are things that we know that a do does, and there are things that we don't know what it does, that it, but it, we know it's involved in. So because it's involved in, say, helping a bear to be hungry at a certain time, to eat more food right before they're going to go into this hibernation mode, it has, in humans, it has these roles, but they're obviously not so clear cut as they are in certain animals. So you want to keep this wide range of actions that melatonin is involved in in mind. And so melatonin is good for people to take, or not, I would say, that's the, I'm not saying it's good, probably would be fine for people to take for a day or two to reset their clocks, you know, with the shift work, but never on a regular basis because you really harm the whole feedback cycle and your own inherent production. And the worst people to give melatonin to certainly would be kids, especially pubescent kids, um, because it is the master controller and it is could potentially have negative impacts on how hormone cycles could begin that may have profound impacts on that reproductive, future reproductive health. Um, so his bit melatonin for the pineal gland affected by light in essence low levels of light. The other important thing on here is this part. Stress is going to reduce it. You also increase your growth hormone secretion when you are in deep sleep. So definitely you need to have deep sleep. Deep sleep increases growth hormone production. Therefore, in kids, when you're trying to have them grow, you want to make sure they get into deep sleep. So one nice rule of thumb would be that we don't sleep with the lights on. You want to be able to have enough melatonin so they can um, go into their deep sleep. However, plenty of kids grow just fine, and they stay on the charts, and they've got like, you know, lights on or night lights and things like that. So it's not the end of the world. I was one when I was baby was little that I always in a dark room when they were babies, and I was pretty militant about it. And then I like to joke around about the worst movie on earth is Monsters, Inc. Because uh, my kids didn't, were not aware of the concept of monsters or anything, so they were totally fine with the dark room until they watched that movie, and then it kind of freaked them out. Even though the cute funny movie, they were like, well, am I supposed to worry about what's in my closet? And I didn't think about it. Now I'm really worried about it. So after that, they have nightlight now. So you know, even though I tell you what's sort of the ideal things, I'm certainly not going to be a hypocrite and let you know that I make plenty of mistakes here too. This last slide is only to point out endocrine means a message put in the blood that goes to go somewhere else. So there are other tissues, the heart, our gut, the thymus, which we haven't talked about yet, and fat, they are all endocrine tissues. But we will talk about them as they come along in their own respective areas. So there may or may not be a test question, again, depending on the version of the test you get, that will ask about you know, which of these tissues also, you know, may produce endocrine or may produce hormones. Yeah, the heart produces hormones. The heart has a hormone that actually lowers blood pressure. The gut has several hormones, but they regulate gut function. So they all, so we, I just wanted you to expand your mind of really what endocrine means and understand that we're going to come across additional hormones as we go along, but not just here. But we're sticking with the classic endocrine tissues. Um, the thymus is usually in the book in this area, and I don't even talk about the thymus because it's part of the immune system, so we'll talk about it then. Maybe you go along, get a piece of paper, turn it maybe sideways, where you can even write your glands here, and then maybe take a picture, like a print off a picture from the internet, like a little thumbnail of a pituitary, and then you can your posterior and your adrenal gland, you know, just kind of like to your, you know, just some stuff in circles with it. And the pancreas has got kind of funky shape, light shady. You know, and that way you've got a visual connection, or put it over here, it would be better. But and then you can say label what the two, what the parts are for each one. And then to complete it, then you can go through and say, all right, what are we, you know, what hormone are the parafollicular cells going to make? Calcitonin. Excellent. Calcitonin. And then you could do the next thing would be. And what does it do? You know, and, then, and what, if you did that, you would have everything really on one page. So calcitonin is going to decrease our blood calcium. And then follicular cells of the thyroid gland, what are they going to produce? T3, T4. Yeah. T3, T4, and that one's going to, in most cases, increase. 
So then the pancreas, the iron little Langer hands, what we can also know about its alphabet. What does it make? Or it makes two, so we'll just go two cells. Alpha and beta cells. Alpha and beta cells. And what do they make? Glucagon. Okay, and glucagon is going to increase. Okay, and then we go through the adrenal gland, adrenal medulla. And then the adrenal cortex, this is going to be the one that's kind of our nightmare one, where we're, yes, yeah, so we have the zona. And then we can do aldosterone. TV's in the way here, we'll do cortisol. Yeah. And if I didn't have the TV there, I would have actually done mineral corticoids, gluten corticoids, sex hormones, and then done that. But the mineral corticoids, that's the hormone family, and then that aldosterone is the main one. Because there's several of them, and so oh. aldosterone's the most common one. So the neural hypothesis here, we're going to do and for the purpose of tests and homework and quizzes and all of that, anterior posterior acceptable or do we anterior want posterior to? is acceptable? Okay. What is not is abbreviation. So I don't want ADH. Unless you have a key somewhere. But otherwise, if it's like for thyroid similar, you write TSH, it'll be off when it's going to stay. But you want it. So I go right about thyroid stimulating hormone, unless you are so used to writing TSH at the end, do it, and then just write me a key. TSH equals thyroid stimulating hormone. I don't do that, that, but it's one of those I need to know that you know what those abbreviations. Because too often in the medical world, people get stuck in abbreviations. They actually don't even know what they mean. They're just pumping out abbreviations. Yeah, they don't have like TSH, 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 TSH,